Okay, in case you're wondering what, what do I need to know for the quiz tomorrow, here's the kind of things that you need to know. First of all, you've got a big old fraction that's got multiple factors on the top and the bottom. You see some that cancel there? All right, what does that create? The whole. And the whole would be at not negative 4, it would be at 4, comma what though? Well, then you go back, when you ca this cancel, I just want to remind you, it creates a 1. Really, those make 1s. But 1 times x plus 3, it's like it's not even there. You know what I mean? Because 1 times something doesn't really change it. So I don't really need the 1s there. But if case everything else cancels, you got to know when you're canceling, technically you're creating 1s. All right, so then this 4 goes in here, and I get 4 and a 4. That makes it 7 over what? 9. You get how I got that spot? Okay, 4 comma 7 ninths. So that means if I was graphing this thing, I'd go over 4 and up 7 ninths, which is almost 9 ninths, which would be almost 1. So it's kind of low down, but it's like about there. And it's an empty spot, so I put an empty spot. All right, next thing, the domain. The domain is comes from the denom denominator, yes. And it tells me all real numbers is always how you start. All real numbers except what? Well, what would crash my function? If I had put in a negative 5, I guess, I know you're doing math, I can help tell by the, I think I could tell by what I hear, but I don't want you to talk right now, because I'm telling you really important stuff. I'm like summing up everything you have to know, so focus. And you can always ask your clarifying questions in a minute when I'm done. All right, so this is all real numbers except x cannot be negative 5. And x cannot be 4. Do you get that? So now those two things are asymptotes or holes, one or the other. This is either an asymptote or a hole, and this is either an asymptote or a hole. Because the point is, it won't work in the function. So when you put it in, it has to do something. It either creates an asymptote or creates a hole. All right, so the hole was this one. So if this one's the hole, then this one must be the vertical. So that's at x equals negative 5. That means there's a line right here at negative 5. That's a vertical asymptote. All right, next thing, the horizontal asymptotes. That's asymptotes that like, like look like this. Okay, I don't know where it's going to be, though, so I better figure it out first. Bob will tell me the answer. Is this bigger on bottom, bigger on top, or same on both? Same on both. And if it's same on both, I can like remove this, and it's still same on both. If it's same on both, it's SOBs are a ratio y equals a ratio of the lead coefficients. What is the lead coefficient on top? 1. On the bottom, 1. So it's a ratio of 1 to 1, which is y equals 1. All right, that's one kind of thing you need to know. What's another kind of thing you need to know? Oh, wait, is there a question, clarifying question on this? Um, on the test, will there be any where there's no canceling? Yes, and if there's no canceling, the only difference is then there's no holes. If there's no canceling, then there's no holes. If this hadn't canceled, like maybe one of these had been a plus and one was a minus, then they wouldn't cancel. Then I would have still had the same domain, but both of them, both of these things would have both been asymptotes because you can have two asymptotes. All right. So let's try another kind you'd have to know for the test. Here's a graph, and here is a line. Let's say it's at, at that spot right there is at 2. And let's say there's a hole way out there at, let's say it's about uh, 16 right there. OK, then that means, actually, what's, what is it in hockey where y you uh, hit the puck right between their legs? What's the, uh, the five? All right, so let's make it the five hole. More exciting. All right, so let's call this five. So that would be four, three, two, one. There we go. Okay. So it's a hole at five. How would I write the equation for that? Well, we start by saying, what if it didn't have a hole? What if it was just a line? Then what's the equation for it? Y equals two. How do I make it have a hole there then? Well, I go back here. I'm going to get rid of that little extra stuff. So there is a hole at five. Then I need a parenthesis and a parenthesis. So that'll cancel, right? And so then it would be what in those parentheses? X minus 5 and X minus 5. Good. 
Okay? So that's how you write an equation for a line that has a hole in it. Well, what if it's a more complicated line? Well, then it's a more complicated equation, but it's the same process. So let's say I had a line that was like this, and it was going through at 1. And it had a hole at, let's say, where x was 2. Then you'd need to know the slope of that line. You know how to figure out the slopes? Rise over run? Okay. So let's say we're able to figure out the slope of this line is like slope is 2. Write me the equation for it. Prove you really understand what I just said. Write me the equation for the blue line. It's got a hole where x is 2. Remember, I said that the slope of this thing is 2. This guy's slope is 2. I'll pause while you work on that. Okay, here's what you should have said. You should have said, well, I know the equation for the blue line. It's y equals 2x plus 1, right? Yes. But the added complication is there's a hole, so you make it a big fraction because all of these are big fractions. And then you put an extra thing on the top and the bottom, and you say x minus 2. Raise your hand if you had that right. All right. So some of you will be ready for the quiz tomorrow. Do you get that this is a slope of 2? Do you get that this is, uh, what's that thing called? The y-intercept. That's how I wrote the line in the first place. It's just basic algebra. All right. So one more. I'd like you to look up here and see if you can find the mistake. Do I see it? What do you think, KT? Okay, so you're saying that the other part of the hole is what's messed up. Let's find out. So how would I figure out if you're right? What, what am I supposed to do to test if you're right? Okay, so I take the negative 4 and I put it where? So you think that's actually right now? Oh, okay. Okay. But just to clarify for those that don't get that part, a lot of people know the hole is at negative 4, but they don't know how to get this part. You take the negative 4 and you put it in. Here and there. All right. Yes, what do you think? So you think this should maybe be a positive, or, or is that what you're saying? Negative, you changing your mind? <laughs> it's actually right, you're saying? Okay, what do you think? The horizontal asymptote. Okay, tell me how you get those again. Bigger on bottom, bigger on top, same on both, right? Okay, but it's not bigger on the bottom. Because I know the bottom's got a 2 and the top doesn't, but it's because it isn't multiplied out. If it was multiplied out, then it would have a 2 on top. So it's actually the same on both. All right. So this is a rare form of torture where there's nothing wrong. <laughs> yes, everything's right. So I just wanted to make you look at it closely, and it looks like you did, and maybe you, you verified that you knew how to do some of this stuff. That's good. All right. Let's do uh, one more, except I'm going to actually have you do the last one. Uh, x squared plus 2x plus 1 over x minus 7 x plus 1. And I'd like you to tell me if there's any holes. The domain of it. The vertical asymptotes. The horizontal asymptotes. And if the Vikings will win another game. Yeah! All right. Give it a shot. Here we go. You should have said x plus 1, x plus 1 over x minus 7, x plus 1. 
And then you notice that that makes a hole. And the hole would be at negative 1, comma, how do I do that other part? Put the negative 1 back in. Negative 1 goes in here. And I get, wait a minute, 0. 0 over anything is 0. Could it be negative 1, comma, 0? Yes, it can. That's OK. Don't let that bother you. All right, it can be 0 on top. It just can't be 0 on the bottom. All right, domain. Domain is everything that would crash it. All real numbers ex work except x cannot be 7. x cannot be negative 1. The verticals come from here. It's either this or this or both of them. And one of them, though, is a hole. And therefore, it's not an asymptote. The other one is an asymptote. This one makes a hole. So this one must be my asymptote. It's right there. x equals 7. The horizontal. Is it bigger on bottom, or top, same on both? Same on both, so it's a ratio of the lead coefficients. There's a 1 over a 1, so it's y equals 1. And the Vikings. Yes. Yes. Will they win another game? Yes. Raise your hand if you think so. Go on record. You think they're going to win at least one more game before the end of the season? Yes. Don't screw up. Before the end of the season. Not forever, for the rest of time. Okay, All right, you three. All right. I'm not saying you want them to win. I'm just asking. And see, it would be kind of ironic if they actually win when they shouldn't win because yeah. they'll lose out on a pick on now. A screw up on a screw up. Yep. That'd be pretty awful. Okay. So who wants to go on record saying they will lose their last games? All right. All right. Okay. That was most people saying they're going to lose, sadly. Okay. Uh, this one has a, one extra little twist in it. It is one of the homework problems. And... A lot of people forget one of the rules, and it's this horizontal one. What's the rule for horizontals again if it's bigger on bottom? It's a bob. What's bob? Zero plus what's on the outside. Do you see how there's something on the outside here? That's why it's not just y equals zero. It's y equals zero plus the two, which makes y equals two. Okay? All right. And it's okay if they don't have anything that cancels. Some people get distressed by that. Nothing's canceling. It's okay. That just means there's no holes. Yes? Uh, yes. If there's nothing on the outside, though, people might get a little confused because there's, but there's nothing there, so what is it? And technically, there is a plus zero there. So that you're right. I could just say it's an outsider. And I sometimes use that. Bob is an outsider. OK. All right. So now we've got to talk a little bit about that worksheet. Do you recall getting a yellow worksheet yesterday? It is on the Algebra Ninja stuff. And the first problem there, x, a, x to the a over x to the b, a lot of people just don't know what, what are you supposed to do there. I think you would have had no problem if I had said that it was x to the third over x. You'd know that, that one of those x's would cancel, and the answer would be x squared. Right? What's another way to think of that? If I consider that a 1, it's pretty much you take x to the 3 minus 1 power, right? So what if it's a's and b's? x to the, oops, see, that's not an x, that's an a. Yep. x to the a minus b. And you may fix yours right now if it isn't done. Because remember, I don't expect you to be done with it yet. I just expect you to, to do to start them last night. And then you're going to finish them tonight. Your homework for tonight is to do that yellow thing completely. And there's another little packet of practice for the quiz tomorrow. This yellow sheet, the quiz on this, isn't until till Thursday. But that's coming up pretty fast, considering tomorrow's the quiz. We really don't have much time to talk tomorrow, so I've got to tell you today. This one, simplify 8b plus b over b. Would you agree that there's a certain order you're supposed to do things in math? Okay, and please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Parentheses come first. Are there any parentheses in this? No. But there really are, and you just didn't know that. Where are the parentheses? Yes, because any big fraction has parentheses in it that you don't always notice. There are parentheses. You have to do that before you divide. So that's one of those little tricks that they never teach you, but is really important as you get into higher level math, that if, there is no, if there's a big fraction, there are parentheses around the top and the bottom. Now, uh, parentheses around a single thing are pretty useless, so I don't need to do this. But you get what I'm saying? The top has parentheses. So I really should do that first. What's 8b plus b? 9b. So it's really just 9b 
over B. Do you get how the B's then cancel and the answer is just 9? That's all there is to it. All right. Next thing. I'm scroll this thing down. Simplify. Or no, rewrite. Do you get that this is the same as X plus Y divided by Y? And remember how I said there's imaginary parentheses like this? Did you know that just like you distribute with multiplying, you can distribute with divide? So it's really x divided by the y, x over y, and y divided by the y. See, each needs to get divided. Just like if you had like a 3 times x plus 4, each of them would get multiplied by the 3, right? In this kind of a problem, each of them needs to get divided by y. So it's like x divided by the y and the y divided by the y. Now, which part of this can you simplify farther? Y over y is really what? So you got a final answer of x over y plus 1. All right. Well, this is the part you need to get good at because seriously, when you move on, I know because I teach the class after this one in pre-calc, it's not that the pre-calc stuff we teach you is that hard. It's that the algebra stuff, the little stuff, doesn't always connect for you. And we've got to get you good at this. That's why we're practicing it. All right, so you, now if you learned it, that this is just like distributing, just like the 3 gets distributed like that, this y needs to get distributed. This gets divided by y, and that gets divided by y. If you learned that, then you're good. You'll get it next time. Because we're going to have one more practice worksheet like this. And then we're going to have the actual quiz on this on Thursday. So tomorrow's homework after you're done with the quiz is another yellow worksheet like you've got right now. Yes? These Y's do cancel, but when they cancel, they don't disappear. Remember when things cancel, they're turning into what? Ones. So that becomes 1 over 1, and 1 over 1 is equal to 1. All right. That is a really common mistake people have is when the things cancel that they disappear. They don't they turn into 1's. Yes? Oh, you wanted to ask about 74. Yes. But let me do this one more. This fraction and a fraction one is really important. I'm telling you, we get this in pre-calc all the time at where you have a fraction in a fraction. You've got to know what to do. So 1 over 1 over m. Would you agree that's the same thing as 1 divided by 1 over m? Because fractions mean divide, don't they? Yes, they do. Fractions just mean divide. So if I change this to 1 divided by 1 over m, then I can change it to 1 times what? m over 1. Because you can change from a divide to a times if you flip the second number. And what's 1 times m over 1? m. Won't that be 1 divided by 1 divided by m? Left to right. I get what you're saying, but the, by the fact this is a longer division sign, that's the big divide. This is a fraction. So it's 1 divided by a fraction. It's because the one divide sign is longer than the other. All right. Now, Mr. R, you asked me to skip on to which one? 74. Okay. Yeah, 73 is pretty easy. If you can't see that these cancel, you're, you're probably in deep trouble. Uh, and 18 divided by 3, then, if you can't do that, also deep trouble. Okay, on to 74, which is this one. Well, 24 and the 10, you don't want to just divide them and get 2.4 because you can't put a decimal into a fraction answer. So instead, you should say, 24 could be made up of 2 times 12, and 10 could be made up of 2 times 5. Why is that good? Because now the 2's can cancel. Okay, so I just reduced it to 12 fifths. You get that? Yeah. All right. Now, numbers can go with numbers, x's can go with x's, and y's can go with y's. There are no other y's, so my numbers are already reduced. My y's can't be reduced. They're just y to the seventh, but my x's now can be. How many x's are left, and where are they? Two of them on the bottom. So it's x squared on the bottom. And there's my answer. So numbers cancel other numbers. X's cancel other X's. Y's cancel other Y's. Okay. Yes? Okay. Yep, we are going to definitely hit those. Uh, we're getting there. Why don't you just let me get there one step at a time here. Uh, I'm not all of them today. We're going to try to do the front side of the sheet today, and I'll talk about the back side of the sheet tomorrow. Okay, so this one, 
I can't move this any farther over, so I'm going to have to rewrite the, the 5 fourths is at the beginning of this problem. There's a 5 fourths and then a parenthesis. For those of you following along at home and can't see past the edge of the screen there, it's like this. Okay, so then if I'm multiplying uh, through to cancel this, first of all, maybe you don't even know that. What you really should do instead of distributing this out like this, which you could do, but it's a real pain, you could multiply this all the way through by one number, and it'll get rid of all my fractions. I'm going to show you a simpler one first. Do you get that if you have 1 half plus x equals 12, that I can multiply through that equation by a 2, and it will cancel all my fractions? Maybe you haven't ever been taught that. It's a really cool way to get fractions out of a problem. So if I want to get that two, uh, the, this fraction out of here, I times this by 2, times this by 2, and times that by 2. What's 2 times a half? 1 plus 2x equals 24. No fractions. Look, Mom, no fractions. All right. So the point is, you can get rid of fractions by simply multiplying by the denominator. All right. So this one has a 5 fourths in it. And it's disappeared because uh, there's a 5 fourths at the front of this thing, 5 fourths. And, and now uh, I'm going to multiply through by not 2, what do you think? By 4. If I multiply everything by 4, I'm going to multiply this side by 4, and I'll multiply this side by 4. Now, do you get the 5 fourths times the 4? The 4's will cancel, and there'll just be a 5 left. So it's 5 times negative 2 plus x. What happened there? I just multiplied this times that. What was that? OK. This is put it away. Uh, then this number times this number will make 5 times 4 is 20. 20 divided by 2 is? So this equals 10 times 4 plus x. What I recommend is everybody write this down. And I know you can solve that. That will be easy now. We multiplied by 4, so we wouldn't have to have fractions anymore. Whenever you've got fractions in your problem, you want to get rid of them because they're a pain. So if you can multiply by something that will just make the fractions all disappear, that's the smart thing to do. It's called clearing fractions. We have you do that a lot next year and the year after that in calc. They tell me, I have had the calc teachers tell me multiple times, why don't you guys just teach them to clear the fractions? So we're trying to stress it more in this level so that you'll get it better next year, etc. Clear the fractions, just get rid of them. Because see, in calc, the fractions aren't as simple as like two-thirds. They're like sine x over cosine x and you want to clear the fractions. So you just multiply by cosine x through the whole thing. It's no big deal. And you'll understand more what the heck that means when you get there. But the point is you have fractions. If we get clearing fractions when they're just numbers, you'll get it when it's calc. All right. So from here, you just multiply this out and this out. Multiply that times that. And then you'll just have to combine like terms. Get your variables all onto one side. You should be able to handle it from there. All right. Let's move on a couple more things off this yellow sheet that you need to know. Scroll to the top, over on the right. Do you know what a box and whisker is? Raise your hand if you think you've been taught this before at some point. All right, all right, but you've forgotten. All right, so here's, here's the basics, and you'll get it if you listen. That's the smallest number in my data. Let's say my data is how much money the kids brought on the field trip. You're a, a uh, math teacher who teaches in fifth grade, and all these kids bring their money to go on Wolf Ridge. Okay? And uh, the smallest amount of money anybody bought was 30 then. What's the biggest amount, according to this data? 50. So somebody brought 50. Okay? What would this number that's right, I'm going to give you a hint, in the middle of, that's the median of the amount the kids brought. And this, this is all about medians. This is the median of the top half, the group that brought the top half of the group, the group that got brought more money than the rest of the people, this is the middle of the top half, and it's called quartile three. Oh, yeah. This one right here is the middle 
of the bottom half of the kids. And that's quartile, what do you think? Two. Because Q1 is considered here, Q2, Q3. Wait a minute, Q1, Q2. I said two and wrote one, sorry. And this is, wait a minute, I'm, I messed up. Sorry, you're right, it's not a quartile. I started right and I ended wrong. I'm going to clear this up. Okay, so that is the minimum, the smallest amount. That's the biggest amount. That's the middle amount. This is the middle of the lower half. This is the middle of the upper half. And this is uh, Q2, no, Q1, quartile 1, and this is Q2, quartile 2. All right, so main point, though, is answer the question. The question is, what was the median? Well, which one of these was the median again? Right there, 35. What's the minimum? 30. 30. Done. Now, why are these box and whiskers any good? Because they divide up your data into parts. Have you ever been asked, like, are you in the top 25% of your class? That kind of thing. Okay, well, if you're in here, you're in the top 25% of this group. If you're in this zone, you're in the bottom 25%. And there's always got to be a bottom 25%, right? And if you're in this zone from here to here, that's the bottom half of the class. If you're in this zone from here to here, that would be the top half of the class. Do you get what I'm saying? All right. That's what box plots do. So they divide up the numbers into sets of 25% of the data. The top 25% is here. The kind of the next 25 is here. The next 25 is here, and the lowest 25 is there. All right. So let's uh, look at this one. Percent of change. All I'm going to write for you is change over a ridge. So you figure out what the change is. The change was a 90 cents over how much was the original? 320 cents. Or you could have said 0.9 over 3.20. But now you got 90 divided by 320. If you can reduce that, you've got your answer. All right, moving on, and these are the last two we're going to talk about today because I feel you like you're slipping into a coma. So this is 45, 45, 90 triangle. It's huge. It's, if you're going to pick, like, top five things you need to know from geometry, these two triangles are one of the top five. You've got to remember these. 45, 45, 90 goes like this. One, one, and what's the other side? Square root of two. Do you remember that? Do you remember seeing that? That's the ratio of those sides. In other words, the two sides are always the same, and then the other side's bigger, and it's always square root of two times as big. So if I make this like a 7, well, what's the one on the bottom got to be? A 7, and then what's the one on the hypotenuse got to be? 7 square root of 2. But then this is the hard part about this one is they made it an A. Well, then you just say, oh, well, it's an A, and an A, and an A square root of 2. So what is B equal to? A root 2. Just ignore the B. If the B wasn't there, what would you have put there? A square root of 2. And therefore, what is B? It's A squared times the square root of 2. All right, then the other ratio you've got to remember is not the 45, 45, 90. It's the 30, 60, 90. It's this guy. If you were uh, having writing issues today, it goes like this, 30. And this is the smallest side here. That's like a 1. This is the biggest side here. That's like a 2. And what's the last one? It's just square root of 3. OK. So then what if I change this? to an 8. What's this got to be then? Notice I'm timesing it by 8, and I'll get 16. And notice I'm going to times this by 8. It's 8 square roots of 3 then. OK? So what if it's not an 8? What if it's a K? If this is my triangle still, and this is K, what's this got to be? 2K. And what would this have to be? 
And notice, if I just get, get rid of this and figure out, like, if that's gone, what would that have to be? It'd have to have a K in it, right? And then if you know the little ratio thing, it's got to have a square root of 3 in it. So it's K root 3. So that's K root 3. Okay, and that boils down to you remembering those triangles. You've got to remember it's 1, 1, square root of 2, and 1 and 2 and square root of 3. That's going to come up again in pre-calc, and I know it's going to come up again in calc. So, again, I'm trying to tell you what's really important to remember. And some of these things we'll do once, like probability. To be honest, you're going to do it once. You're probably not going to need to remember it much. Some of our calc teachers don't even remember how to do probability stuff. Okay, so probabilities are not that important to what you do in high school math. You might go into a branch of math later in life where probabilities are a big deal. Like if you're an actuary, they get paid big money by the insurance companies to figure out what's a probability that you will die because they want to figure out how much to charge for life insurance. So they figure out these complicated models where they figure out how much life you have left. Did you know as like a 16-year-old or some of you guys, let's say that you're 15, whatever, uh, we can tell on average how long you're supposed to live. Your normal life expectancy is like 85 years old, let's say, okay? But you guys are actually expected to live more than 70 years because 70 plus 15 to be 85 seems like it'd be such a simple thing. But you've already made it 15 years. Doesn't that mean you have a better chance than just an average person? Do you get what I'm saying? So an average person that, started, that just started their life could have died by now, but you're already here. You know what I mean? So you're still here, and you've proven you don't, you know, you're, you're alive. You've, you didn't have a disease that was going to cause you to die this early. And so now your life expectancy is, like, instead of just plus 70 years, you probably have 75 years. What happens for a person who's like, my dad is 84 years old. Does he have a life expectancy of zero? Like, as soon as you hit 85, you're supposed to just instantly die? No. If you're 85, then they give you, like, 10 more years. If he's 85, he'll probably live... To 90. And so anyway, that probability stuff could come in handy in some jobs, but it's not something we need for the next few years. You'll need it only on your MCA test for the state of Minnesota. When you're a junior, you have to pass a little section on, GM, or on that. We'll remind you right before you take it how to do that stuff. All right. This stuff, really important. We're going to go over it again and again until you make sure you remember it. All right. So we're done practicing that stuff for now. What's your homework? Your homework is... A little review, that yellow sheet that you have right now, you should just finish it up. There's a backside to it that I did not talk about. If you need help on any of it, you can go watch the videos at AlgebraDinja.com. I made them. I think if you, you know, wanted me to explain it right now, I'd probably explain it just like I explained it on the videos. So go home and watch the videos if you feel like you're behind in that stuff. This is your homework. It is a worksheet that helps you for the t quiz tomorrow. The quiz the next day is on the yellow sheet stuff. Okay, so any questions? Yes. Okay, the packet you already have in your possession has a part C to it, and that part C was what we were going to assign today, but then one of the teachers looked at it closer and realized it didn't have any practice on a certain kinds of problems that are on the test. And so he's like, we can't give him part C because it isn't really a good prep for the test. So we're throwing out the rest of that packet. You keep what you've done. We may still grade that later, but don't have time today. This is going to replace that part C. And the reason it was made was specifically because it's a good preparation for the quiz, which means if you don't know how to do stuff on here, you're going to fail the quiz tomorrow. So if I were going home tonight and I was doing my homework and I was getting tripped up on some part of it, I'd go look at the answers very closely because there's questions just like this on the quiz tomorrow. And if you still don't get it, then maybe you should come and get some help. But tomorrow morning is a Wednesday, so that's not going to really work so well. At that point, you're going to need to ask some questions right before we start the test. Or even better, ask a smart friend. Call them and say, do you know how to get like number six?